Geoengineering does not solve the problem. Geoengineering, in, in my view, is effectively a sticking plaster on gangrene. So you've got this nasty disease that is eating away at your body. And every time it gets a bit bigger, you put a bigger plaster over it. You can't see it. Then it comes out the sides. It gets a bit bigger. And so, so it doesn't solve the problem. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't try and pursue it. I'm extremely concerned about climate interventions um, for many reasons. First of all, because the scientific community has kind of been used to justify uh, using solar radiation management, um, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, the wrong way. Um, but also because uh, we're fully aware of, of a lot of the negative consequences of such climate interventions. We know that solar radiation management, for example, could create more acid rains, could disturb the monsoon, the Indian monsoon. Uh, it would be the whole water cycle that would be affected. We know also that we will not be able to scale up most of these pseudo solutions in time, and this is their main argument, that because we are in an emergency, we need to act quickly, we need to press all the buttons we can press, but actually, it is already too slow to make things happen. It is very urgent and immediately critical to really enhance the capacity of global South countries and universities and researchers to look into this work. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether we would ever need these technologies or whether we would never even have to use it. It doesn't matter the fact that others are pushing for it and researching it and trying to understand more, we should take part in those process of answering the unknowns, which is currently what will help us to define, should we go further? Should we stop? Is it viable? Is it not viable? That should not be left to a particular kind of people and a kind of countries to look into that. That should be a global thing and every country should be able to participate. We are facing some catastrophic things if we don't explore climate interventions. I think that the climate intervention conversation is inevitable. People don't want to have it from the conservation perspective because it provides an excuse to not scale back. Uh, so it, th that is a dilemma for sure. However, yeah, it, I don't really want to defend the climate interventions uh, or to promote them, but we need to contemplate them. Uh, because we're passing by certain targets and, and threatening tipping elements uh, that the it's it's not a new argument that we may be forced to use these tech no fixes i think we need to talk about climate intervention aka geoengineering i'm certainly not an advocate of climate engineering but i would like to know what it is that i'm saying no to if i do want to say no to it and i'd want to know how we balance the short-term need to save lives and protect the vulnerable with the long-term anxieties we naturally have about governance and other effects that go with exploring more aggressive approaches to controlling our environment. I started recording interviews on geoengineering over 10 years ago, and the thought back then that in the mid-2020s nothing would have been achieved in global emissions reduction would have been too depressing to contemplate. Yet here we are. The Paris Agreement was meant to steer the world towards a cleaner, brighter future, but it has been ignored. Emissions from forest fires and melting permafrost are way beyond their thresholds, and extreme weather impacts are testing infrastructure and ecosystems all over the planet. Climate activists are even being locked up with cruel prison sentences for trying to act for the collective good. I discuss this in my next episode with XR co-founder Gail Bradbrook. A preview of the next episode is available for subscribers and will be made public in a week's time. The UN Climate Summit COP29 will be held in one of the most significant cradles of the fossil fuel industry, Baku in Azerbaijan. There is no expressed intention to reduce emissions, but instead the COP29 president-designate Mukhtar Babayev has I quote, a vision to enhance ambition and enable action, end quote. Whilst the widespread extraction of fossil fuels continues. With all this in mind, the conversation of engineering interventions to try and delay the most destructive impacts of extreme climate is moving along. It is controversial and divisive, and yet voices from across the world, including in the global south, are saying that we need to take the research seriously. In this interview with Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, Director of the Centre for Climate Repair at the University of Cambridge, we discuss the controversy and the viability of schemes. 
The news broke during our recording that the UK government agency, ARIA, have put out a call for proposals, offering £56.8 million in grant funding for geoengineering projects, the largest government funding of its kind to date. The failure of the global negotiations is discussed in my book Cop Out, How Governments Have Failed the People on Climate, that is available worldwide in paperback and audiobook format. Sadly, the failure of the last three decades of global climate summits means we are getting much deeper into the era of consequences. Central Europe is experiencing deathly storms and flooding while the smoke from Portugal's forest fires are spreading a toxic blanket over Spain and beyond. From the Amazon to Asia, ecosystems and infrastructure are being pummeled by nature's response to carbon pollution. Next week I will be recording a three-way interview with Professor Paul Davies from the UK Met Office and Dr Hayley Fowler from Newcastle University about their research paper titled A New Conceptual Model for Understanding and Predicting Life-Threatening Rainfall Extremes, which is both important and fascinating. Thanks again to all subscribers. Look out for subscriber-only content in the YouTube members area and also on Patreon. There's a lot of discussion at the moment around geoengineering in terms of research and deployment for cooling, for let's say um, solar radiation management, for example. Scientists are now forecasting that we're, we're on pretty much on track to go over two degrees, let alone you know um, holding to one point five. Assuming we stay on this path, do you see geoengineering as an inevitability? So my view is that the world of climate engineering is still at a nascent stage in terms of uh, knowledge development. The type of approaches, whether it's stratospheric aerosol injection, marine cloud brightening, cirrus cloud thinning, whole raft of different approaches. We don't have the knowledge base right now to be able to say, actually, this is what it's going to cost. This is what the impact is going to be. You know, lay it out. So actually people can make informed decisions today. And yet we need to get to a position in short order, in fairly quick time, where people can make those informed decisions. And it will be for some wider society at large to determine whether some of these approaches should be tried or not. And actually, let's be absolutely clear that any approach that's be, that is developed even if it's we've done field trials and things like this, we won't know whether it's going to work unless and until it's been tried in earnest. So even then, you could argue it's still going to be an experiment. And you know, do I think it's likely? I do think it's likely that we're going to get to that point. We're already seeing certain actors who've, in my view, demonstrated things or, or trying to even sell cooling credits. They're not verified. So we're not going to stop these things at the moment. So we're already starting to see people having a go at this, Nick. And I think it's more important that we increase our knowledge base and so that people can make more informed decisions as to whether we should be doing these or not. But at the moment, if we're going to go to temperatures in excess of two degrees, then I do think it's likely that somebody, a group of nations, for example, might decide, look, we're going to need to sort of try this in earnest, but we can't at the moment because we don't have the knowledge base. And one of the things you've said previously and so of others is that you need um, a lot of public consultation, people uh, from around the world, not just from one group of wealthy nations or anything like that. But the, the, the kickback I'm hearing all the time from scientists, even in the very, very recent interview, is comparing this to putting a sticking plaster on cancer and the really, we shouldn't be even investing in research, we should be investing in decarbonisation. What do you say to these climate scientists who are are kind of forming a blocking position, even around trying to block discussion as much as anything else around geoengineering? Well, let me start by saying, you know, they are absolutely entitled to an opinion, all right, in terms of, as is everybody, in terms of what we should be able to research, able to consider. So, I mean, I think it's actually healthy that we respect different views. But therein is my point. We do need to ensure that we listen to different parties from around the world. And it's not just the climate scientists. So I still remember at 
COP last year, so COP28. Ilana Said, um, she is the United Nations ambassador to the islands of Palau in, in the Pacific. And it was in one of the um, country pavilions. And she said, what's happening in terms of the climate? When you are considering sea level rise, which appears inevitable given our current progress, you know, one or two metres of sea level rise is not a case of losing a bit of beach for my country. We have no country. We have nowhere to live. We have nowhere to grow our food. And therefore, we need to be considering things that will prevent the sea level rise whilst we get greenhouse gas levels down. These voices, they might be minority voices, Nick, but they need a big seat at the table, just as big as everybody else, for sure. But these are the ones at the front line of climate change. And in fact, we need to be listening to them and actually what they think is important because you know they're desperate and we need to be thinking about uh, in a civilized world of actually caring for others. And it's this sort of thinking about others that really, really, I think, drives, uh, hopefully, global decisions. Yeah, and a lot of diverse voices coming out of the COPs at the moment is very interesting. In the course of the last, let's say, 12 months as a time frame, what's been the most standout development in geoengineering research that's piqued your attention? Well, it's the 13th of September, 1441. And since we've been speaking, the UK government has issued a call for proposals on climate engineering through the organization called ARIA. That's the Advanced Research Innovation Agency. This for me is really, really significant because what it's saying is that a government thinks, look, this is an important area of work that we have not had sufficient funding, government funding allocated to, to basically get our knowledge base increased to therefore help society make more informed decisions about these sorts of things. If anything, Nick, I think that is the most significant marker in the last 12 months to say, look, this is what we are going to be uh, supporting. Now, there have been a number of other developments in the field, uh, some of which are positive, some of which are not so positive. But I think really, you know, it's making sure that we've got heightened awareness at country level, government level, to say these are important issues. Given that this has come out of the UK government and uh, appealing to your objectivity, being a, the director of Centre for Climate Repair, but where does the research power, the innovation, the, the the greatest advancements lie at the moment? Is it in the US? Is is the UK really advancing on this? Is Australia? Is it Japan, China? Who's Who's really leading on geoengineering research? Well, historically, I think you could say it's been mainly the US, all right? And that's where they've had you know, more money, more people involved in this. However, actually, I think it's more of a global initiative now. So, you know, first of all, yes, there are activities uh, in Australia, there are continue to be activities, of course, in the United States, but here in Europe as well. We've got ourselves, you know, a group in Cambridge, but there's a, a group at TU Delft, um, people in Exeter, very involved, and a group in Manchester, just to name but a few. And that's just, I'm going to call that the Global North. But the Degrees Initiative, which is an amazing organisation, is supporting scientists from the Global South as well, Nick. So I really see this as a global endeavour and a global interest. And in fact, there's a conference next year in Cape Town being run by the Degrees Initiative in March of next year. And then there'll be a, another one in Cambridge in June, just showing this increased level of interest in this field. And on top of that, we've got side events or sessions at things like AGU, American Geophysical Union, one in ICARP in, in Boulder, Colorado. There were discussions in Chile only last week. So I'm seeing interest from around the world. And I think this is really, really healthy. And it's not about saying we're going to go and do this. There's interest around the world in increasing our knowledge base so that actually we can get our head around what this might be. And it might all come to us learning that it's a terrible idea. Let's be clear about that. 
we wouldn't be pursuing it if we didn't think it had potential to be a good idea, but we are still being completely objective. We need to let the science speak. And do you think that that's the dangers, the things that won't work and the things that should be avoided at all costs, that when these float to the top, that they will become as important as as a knowledge base for the world? I hope so. Let's say your earlier question of, Sean, is this inevitable? Well, let's say somebody decides, look, we're going to go and try something because, you know, we've had three years without any food because the rains haven't come. And, you know, it's a ridiculously situation. We've got mass starvation in the country. As a result of climate change, we're going to need to try and do something. Let's say that, you know, in desperation, someone says, we're going to try and do this. As a minimum, I'd like to be in a position where we can at least equip them with the knowledge to say, well, if you are going to put, pull a lever, please don't pull that one. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to see emerge from COP29 on the subject of interventions that could be useful as well, because next year is the mega COP in Brazil. And, you know, this is the last stepping stone before we get to that mega COP. Is there in that sort of time frame something you see that could be really valuable that could probably build on what we've just heard from the UK government? What I would really, really like to see is an acknowledgement that A, the current forecast we've got are not satisfactory. Back to the people on the islands of Palau, you know, they are going to be faced with no country during, in the next few decades uh, or 100 years, hundreds of years. You know, th- this is what we're on course to be delivering at the moment. And therefore, what I would like to have at the COP is at least an acknowledgement that there is a need for a, not only the necessary and position of emissions reduction and necessary position on greenhouse gas removal. Uh, If we're going to go and, let's say, keep below two degrees, we'll get below two degrees centigrade by the end of the century. What about having open, frank discussions about other things that we might need to consider, such as climate engineering? And to have at least this mentioned in the room, rather than it just being a taboo topic. But it has grown in recent years that the COPs, I mean, it, 10 years ago, there wasn't a single discussion that I could see in, say, in Paris, for example, talking about geoengineering. It was very much a taboo. Last year, there were quite a few events with this as a major topic. There, there were, and I was very pleased. It was, to my recollection, was the first COP where there were events being held, and a number of them that were dedicated to this particular topic. But those are in the, those are in the, pavilions. I'm still not aware of that topic being discussed in the negotiation room. And that's what I would like, at least acknowledgement and discussions in that. Okay. I suppose to get to that stage, it needs to mature into a sort of digestible framework of some kind. Absolutely. But even just even an acknowledgement that, gosh, we're not on, we're not on track, everything we're doing you know, there are some other things that we may need to consider at a future COP. That would be a huge step forward, in my view. Well, look, thank you very much. It's been very good to talk to you. Thanks, Dave. A second part of this conversation focusing on greenhouse gas removal is available in the subscriber area.